and we're at 10.01. We've still got some people joining, but I think that's fine. Um, we'll go ahead and get started. Okay, so I'm seeing a lot of the same names that we saw from last Friday. Welcome to the 2021 Allied Health Conference, uh, part two. Um, part one was on Friday. Thanks to everybody who's joining us. I am Cliff Judy with the Missouri Community College Association. Um, we are holding this, uh, usually this is an in-person event, obviously because of the pandemic. We canceled it last year. We decided to do it virtually this year. Um, this is being held in conjunction with State Fair Community College. We are sponsored by Central Methodist University. Um, we have uh, more than, now last week I said we had nearly 40 health science instructors signed up. We have more than 40 health science instructors signed up as of today from nine different Missouri mm -hmm. community colleges. Um, and we are here um, registered to talk about compassion fatigue. Um, we have also sent this uh, invite out to our health science instructor friends at Central Methodist and at the University of Missouri, because um, unlike a lot of our other professional development opportunities, you know, we didn't want to just keep this in house. We consider this a public service. Um, and uh, so we have a pretty good crowd here. Uh, appreciate everybody who's attending. Um, there are a lot of statistics out there, uh, and I went through this on Friday, but just to repeat how important an issue um, staff turnover and compassion fatigue is right now in the healthcare industry, NSI Nursing Solutions put out its retention and staffing report back in March, and at the time, they had found that staff RN turnover in 2020 rose by 2.8 percentage points and that made it reach 18.7%. So basically nearly one in five nurses who are walking away from either their job or from the industry entirely. I'm gonna go ahead and get to our presenters now. We couldn't have done this without um, Dr. Rhonda Hutton Gann of State Fair Community College. I'm wearing my State Fair gear today. Uh, couldn't have done this without Dr. Andrew Ferguson of State Fair Community College as well. She's going to be our main presenter today. Uh, and obviously could not have done this without uh, Central Methodist University. And with that, I'm going to kick it over to um, Dr. DeGan Dixon to tell us a little bit about what CMU has going on. Thank you so much and uh, glad to be here. And if you don't have storms coming your way yet, uh, you know, brace yourselves because um, I was in a little bit of a panic right before, as, as Cliff knows, I was uh, with no internet and not much cell service, but um, you know, I mean, this is a, a true uh, state of what our our students uh, contended with, you know, with, especially during the pandemic. And I'm very thankful for Zoom and web conferencing and distance learning. Um, it did allow us to continue on, um, you know, last over the uh, the course of the year. So, so good morning and uh, thank you for being here. Um, you know, welcome back. I, I, I appreciate the opportunity. We appreciate the opportunity to sponsor today's Allied Health Conference and uh, certainly appreciate you taking the time to learn more about what's affecting our health industry and, and your employers and certainly your students. So thank you for the important work that, that all of you do. Um, and um, I'd, I'd also like to thank MCCA. Um, you know, this wouldn't be, um, this opportunity wouldn't come to us. We wouldn't have the opportunity to share resources like this if it weren't for the good work that you do there at MCCA. So thank you so much, Cliff. Um, I just wanted to quickly um, um, remind people, or maybe if, if you're, uh, you're new to Central Methodist University, um, this might be new to you, but it was several MCCA annual conference ago, we actually revealed a new transfer scholarship um, named after our provost, Dr. Rita Golstad, and I think uh, many of you know Rita and know the important work that she's always done, not just for CMU, but for the state of Missouri uh, when it comes to, um, you know, transfer opportunities for our community college graduates. And so we created a Golstad transfer scholarship that's available for um, your students, and I'm going to quickly share my screen here so you can just see quickly what um, the scholarship looks like. The Goldstad uh, Transfer Scholarship, we actually have two. One um, is for students who would transfer from your institution uh, to Fayette, and they would uh, continue their education there on the Fayette campus. That's, that's a wonderful opportunity, especially if you have students who 
would like a college experience, a college campus, student life experience. Maybe they even want to um, you know, go to the Fayette campus and participate in many of our um, you know, performance-based opportunities, whether that's sports or music or theater. Um, you know, there's a lot of opportunities by being a student on our, our Fayette campus. Um, the Goldstad Scholar Scholarship for the Fayette campus um, is a $16,000 scholarship that um, a, if they have the qualifications related to the uh, scholarship that you see there, then it, it really is, is almost an automatic. I mean, they do have to fill out a, a scholarship application and, and uh, go through the, the financial assistance process. Um, but that $16,000 scholarship is awarded to students who have graduated from your program and who are transferring to the Fayette campus. The other Goldstat Achievement Scholarship that you see on the screen is for our Extended Studies online students. And we've uh, awarded scholarship dollars to our community college partners uh, and give them an opportunity to process this and um, um, scholarship students who want to continue from your institution to Central Methodist University in an online um, or extended studies program. So those opportunities are there. You can talk to any of us um, at Central Methodist. We all are very aware of this scholarship and its, um, its opportunities for our community college partners. So that's all for me. And I thank you the opportunity to, uh, to visit with you again today. And I wish you well in your conference. I hope you don't mind if I bug out because I have a feeling I'm going to drop out with the signal anyway. So I hope the conference goes well today. Thank you, Dr. Degan Dixon, very much from Central Methodist University, our, our sponsor for today's conference. So um, there are a lot of things that had to come together, uh, but obviously if we don't have a sponsor, we don't have a conference. So thank you, Dr. Degan Dixon, and good luck with your power issues today. Good luck with your connectivity issues today. Um, so when I started, when we started planning for this conference a few months ago, I asked Dr. Hutton Gann what we should talk about, and um, she didn't hesitate. Um, she said that healthcare industry leaders are extremely concerned about con compassion fatigue, what it's doing to their staff, and obviously that has a ripple effect to patient care. Um, they wanted students equipped for these really hard grinding moments in their lives, and that's what we're going to talk about today. Um, on, on Friday, we talked about identifying compassion fatigue um, and, and understanding it. Today, we're going to talk about um, solutions. And before we get to that, though, we um, it was really important. I didn't just want to have someone say, well, we're hearing from healthcare industry leaders. I wanted somebody from the healthcare industry to actually come and talk to us about what the situation is with, um, you know, somebody with boots on the ground. So we have Dr. Christy Dempsey here. She is Ch Chief Nursing Officer Emerita at Press Ganey. She has over three decades of healthcare experience, and if you read her bio, it is just a laundry list of accomplishments and all of that. The one that stuck out to me, of course, she serves on a variety of boards and everything like that, but she was twice named one of the top 50 safety experts in the country by Becker's Hospital Review. And so with that, Dr. Dempsey, can you please um, just let us know what's happening right now on the ground and, and, and talk to us a little bit about why what we're talking about today is so important. Absolutely, thank you, Cliff. And it's a pleasure to be with everybody today. This is such an important topic. Uh, you know, we learned on Friday um, a lot of the, the reasons for compassion fatigue right now, the pandemic just being one of them. Uh, it, but compassion fatigue is prevalent in healthcare. I am also going to say, but I have a foot in both worlds. So I am the chief nursing officer emerita at Press Ganey, but I also teach at Missouri State. And my class is leadership and management. So I'm teaching nursing students. This is the last class before they graduate. And I can tell you that there's compassion fatigue there too. And they are just beginning their nursing careers, but they have spent the entirety of their nursing school during the pandemic. So they have a unique perspective and I think compassion fatigue applies here too. So in 2020, uh, Shenefelt and uh, colleagues wrote an article for JAMA and it was how, 
the, the origins of anxiety and some strategies for that during the pandemic. And I thought it was appropriate for this conversation to talk about it. So they, they interviewed physicians and nurses and, and all of the people that this group teaches. And it narrowed down to um, about eight things that people were worried about. They were worried about access to PPE. They were worried about exposure to COVID and then family exposure. They were worried about testing. They were worried about their organization's commitment to them. They were worried about access to childcare, support for whatever personal and family needs based on their care of COVID patients. They were worried about being competent in floating to other areas, which there was a lot of and still is with the pandemic. And they were worried about lack of access to, uh, to information and communication. And let's face it, except for the access to PPE, which has gotten better, all of the other stuff still applies. And so the authors boiled it down to hear me, protect me, prepare me, support me, and care for me. So those were the things that people working in healthcare today need to avoid or at least mitigate, if possible, compassion fatigue. So when you think about Hear Me, it's about creating input and feedback. When you think about Protect Me, it's about the PPE and testing and information. Prepare Me is about rapid training. Give them the information that they need to do the job they have to do today. Clear communication, making decisions together. And Support Me is about their physical needs and their, their, the logistics of getting to and from work and, and getting their family taken care of. And then Care For Me is exactly what it sounds like. Show me that you care about me that it's not just, um, uh, I'm not just staff. I am a person and you see me. And this all boils down to, we all studied Maslow, right? And we probably teach Maslow. This all boils down to safety. People can't address compassion fatigue until they feel safe in what they're doing. So as educators, how do we help our students feel safe to go out into this new healthcare world and mitigate compassion fatigue? So with that, I'm going to turn it over to our speaker. She's wonderful and has wonderful solutions, I'm sure. Thank you again for the opportunity. Thank you, Dr. Dempsey. My name is Andra Ferguson, and I'm going to do, talk to you about part two of um, compassion fatigue in education. So I will first share my screen. Okay, okay. here we go. Okay, so compassion fatigue in education. Uh, thank you, first of all, to everyone who attended the first part of the presentation last week. Last week, we discussed identifying problems and uh, symptoms of compassion fatigue and how to recognize symptoms in ourselves and our coworkers and our students. If you're newly joining the session, no worries. The information today should still make sense and can be easily applied in your life and within the curriculum. Also, just this last week, I said like all the clip art throughout the presentation was free from the internet. If there's any pictures that I use, I have permission to use those. And I've cited most sources at the bottom of each slide as well as in the reference list, unless it is data that has been collected from my own um, practices and travel and international work. So I will start with introductory tips for educators. These are some general things to know. Uh, expect when you're coming into a classroom that some students, as well as coworkers, may arrive in states of hyperarousal 
or other states that may interfere with learning. They may seem disruptive or distracted, disengage, sometimes may even seem disrespectful. Almost all of the time, students and coworkers do not realize how they're presenting, which makes it a bit of a challenge to address. It's best to address as a group and to be able to do things to um, redirect those emotional states into the educational process. Students may not be mentally or emotionally available for learning, but the best response should be therapeutic and not punitive. So providing instruction directly for impulse control, body regulation, mindfulness, and other skills to be proactive in a strategy to promote faculty and student physical and psychological well-being. So I'm going to talk about the things to do in the classroom. And then the second portion is going to be things to do specifically for oneself. And the oneself um, strategies can be applied and taught to students and faculty and be able to put it within the curriculum. Intervention, here we go. What to do as an educator to combat compassion fatigue. The Deming model, the plan, do, check and adjust is um, what I've used to describe how, how to do this. So it is very important to make a concrete plan written, if at all possible, to best combat compassion fatigue in your life and those around you. The first two um, items listed on this list are to recognize the phenomenon. This is what we talked about last week, the symptoms of in the various categories of life. And then to understand why the changes are happening, the neurochemistry, what goes into the fight, flight, chronic stress, uh, how those things affect the body and the mind and behavior in every aspect, and then to make the plan. That's part of what we're going to do today develop the timeline for the plan, be ready for the plan. And then before implementing the plan, we take care of yourself, okay? The self has to come first. Just like the airplane model, you have to put the oxygen on yourself before you put it on your children, before you put it on your neighbor to be able to help others. If you do not take care of yourself, you will not be able to take care of others long-term. Now, I realize this is counterintuitive, counterintuitive to our empathic ways, but this is a win-win in the long race. You'll be able to help more people more directly and for longer periods of time if you take care of yourself first. And I'll come back to that again. Like I said, there's a whole section we're gonna talk about. So having the specific plan, um, implementing the plan and then adjusting the plan evaluate, see what's working, see what needs more attention or less attention. Things to know. Emotion and learning are inextricably connected by interdependent neural processes. They're happening together. Emotions are always present in students, faculty, everyone. Emotions are always present. They can enhance learning or they can impede learning. So it's very important to consider that happening, that it's not just information providing and information gathering, that emotion is always attached. The brain seeks connections in order to learn and learning is a social process. It, it takes place in partnership, the educators, the students, the peers, the family origin, Every aspect of life that contributes to emotion and learning contributes to the learning concepts. So when individuals are provided with healthy ways to process negative events, they're better able to self-regulate. And when they can self-regulate, they return to a healthy state to be able to make decisions, creates positive emotion, and overall promotes resiliency. 
So promoting resiliency in the classroom specifically will show or model to students and help students be able to handle future stress management situations much better in the field as well as in the future classes. It's important to do this early on um, and in every class to be able to regularly address this issue. Key concepts for creating a therapeutic classroom. So some of the things that we'll note are to have an environment that is emotionally warm versus cold. The old chalkboard and desk sitting straight up is um, not necessarily advisable. Um, an emotionally warm environment where there's participation from students and a sharing of ideas in the classroom and actual application of concepts in the classroom before they get to their uh, clinical rotations and clinical sites and experiences. Organized is better than, predict than unpredictable. And that doesn't mean it has to be a cold organization. We think of organization as being sharp corners no, no curves taken um, off the beaten path. It doesn't mean that. It means organized as far as time schedule, as far as expectations, and um, they know what they're coming to every day, to whereas in the world they may not necessarily. Students don't know what they're going home to or what the future holds, but if they can come to the classroom and know what's expected, that is one place that at least they can have that peace. They're secure versus threatening cooperative versus competitive. So some teachers have implemented competition in the classroom without even realizing it's happening. Sometimes there's games that people play where it, it pits one student against another in competition. And it's really more beneficial for a student to do a cooperative type game where there's building upon concepts and uh, supporting each other instead of the competition. There's learning centered versus compliance centered and student focused versus curriculum focused. Now that again is a fine line. We can't just go into um, total student led process. So the curriculum is incorporated of course, but to relate that specifically to what's going on with students and be able to cross those connections and apply them specifically in the moment. Ultimately, the classroom should be a safe place for idea sharing and gaining tools for our professional wellness and success, as well as within their education. So I've made a to-do list and it is to create the therapeutic classroom. And I'll give some more tips and hints about how to do that, which will enhance social emotional learning. From that, there will be brain changes as we know, our environment shapes the chemistry of our brain and how it functions, which then promotes student resiliency and adds to the social and emotional wellness, as well as high achievement. When these things are incorporated into the classroom and into the curriculum, achievement scores go up even in the same population of students. So some suggestions for classroom planning. And Cliff Judy's making this PowerPoint available to everyone after the um, conference is complete. And so you will have access to these things as well as feel free, you can always contact myself or Cliff Judy or anyone on the uh, management team for more information. So these suggestions for the classroom, to set clear behavior standards and train students to take responsibility for their own mental health. So as far as behavior standards, it includes everything from dress, posture, expectations for participation, how students interact with each other, as well as the teachers pre-class, when they're to be there, how they're to be prepared, and if, if there's an after-class type, type of expectation. Enforce the rules fairly and consistently. Don't start out strong and then loosen up. 
make sure it's consistent, same expectations, the same things every single day for every class. Continue to maintain the rules for the classroom. Promote social support systems inside the classroom, like study groups, group assignments. Again, that cooperative learning really helps with, it's one of the major things that helps combat compassion fatigue. Promoting social support and inclusion is, is extremely important for student success. We had talked about last week the um, isolation, feelings of isolation, specifically in um, marginal groups and how that plays into the role in the classroom as well as retention rates to be able to address those things. And then also recognizing symptoms and taking early action and prioritize needs. So when you walk into your classroom and it's restless or it's silent or quiet to say something, talk about self-care as much as you possibly can, work it into treatment planning with all of the health professionals. Some type of action needs to be taking, taken every single day to address self-care. And when, even when we're doing treatment plans for our patients working in the self-care, how are they gonna be able to take care of their emotional needs? How are they going to be able to deal with the fatigue and the caregiver and all of the things that are going to add to their particular situation, making the real life what students experience every day part of what they're learning. Okay, this slide is a little bit different. It is not just classroom information, it is for the institution. And these are some suggestions. Uh, some, some institutions are more open than others, of course. I think in the health science, field, we're very attuned to what our mind and body needs, and we have a little bit of an advantage as far as that goes. So encouraging support from students and faculty, and that includes going to roundtables, being a part of faculty association, sometimes assigning roles and assignments, but cooperative is always better. When you can take a few moments in a class session for active intervention, toward self-care and toward compassion fatigue, it makes and helps your students be more available for the learning that is going to take place that might not take place if you don't do those things. And I'll give you some examples exactly how to work that into the curriculum here in a bit. Partnership with outside agencies such as this, many of the health science leaders in the state of Missouri coming together to learn, having open communication, uh, with health officials, with each other, with community agencies, being able to do things like this to offer support and relief. Self-care, again, this cannot be repeated enough times. It is in every aspect, every single day for each one of us. And personal empowerment. Uh, professional development, knowing and being able to recognize this is definitely compassion fatigue or these are symptoms of what's happening instead of a, I just don't feel well, I don't know what's wrong, being able to know and identify to be able to do something about it. The next are some resiliency factors in the classroom, which is a little different than strategies for um, classroom curriculum. So these things will help your students be able to perform better, think better, make better decisions, and be better. Uh, clear teacher expectations, methodology that addresses learning style varieties. I often ask students if they know their learning style, if they have any preferences at the beginning of a course. We, it's part of our introductions, like I'm a audio listener. I learn best when I'm close to the front. And sometimes it's out of their uh, comfort zone or they may not know. And so we investigate through the course of, or the process of the course to see what their learning styles may be. Cultural relevance incorporating that into the classroom, to the talk of the classroom, building relationships, engaging students by teaching through context. One of the faculty on my team does a fantastic job of relating various types of medications to 
actresses and actors that are um, often what our students are watching and learning or something they've seen on um, reality TV. She uh, relates those things. So they remember, oh yeah, I know exactly what that means. Creating context and connecting the content with that that resonates with students. And social emotional learning within the curriculum. Many of these things you're probably already doing. It is very important for students to relate to immediate application for them to invest their time and attention. If they're distracted and disengaged, as well as um, the generation that is our, the largest number in our classrooms at this time, time and attention matters. Immediate application really matters. And to be able to do that and give it the thought ahead of time is really to their advantage. Suggested techniques for creating a therapeutic classroom. So support through structure. And I'll, I'll give you an example. Um, I teach pharmacology and we do an out of classroom practice before class, which I had taught them in the first year that they started into dental hygiene school. And that is one of them in the class, they take turns being responsible for preparing for class that day. And they take probably 15 minutes, maybe before class. And I compare it to stretching before the big game. You stretch your mind, you stretch your emotions, you get ready for class. You don't just show up. <laughs> so in the first, um, they do this before we get to class. And then the first five minutes of class, they can ask questions or talk about whatever they want. It's about half and half, whether they'll go to um, content of the course or whether they have something outside the course, maybe related to curriculum for the program or just in general, something that they need to say about their new puppy or how that may relate. Five minutes and then five minutes we do Five minutes after that, we do specific content, asking questions about the week before, um, the weeks before to prepare for, we're going to take a quiz at the 10 minutes in. And 10 minutes in, we'll take the quiz and then we review for the review the quiz and we relate it to all the things that we talked about in the first five minutes. How that puppy is going to relate to what they learned on the quiz regarding a particular medication or pain control or um, any aspect of that. Everything in those first five to 10 minutes is related to the quiz afterwards and it solidifies that information. And then we talk about future content, the things that we're going to be doing that day. But the, the support through structure, the structure is exactly the same for every day that they come. They know what to expect. They know what they're gonna do. They know how they're gonna feel. And I've had students say that even though it is a regular thing, we're not in our seats the whole time. We're not, it's not a boring process just because they know what's expected. It is regular, there's no surprises and they don't feel the anxiety because they know what's going to happen and they've prepared for it. Anything as far as the suggested techniques that have to do with expressive modalities, drama, writing, storytelling, music, art, games. We do a presentation again in um, a special needs, special patient needs course to where one of the students could um, pretend they do a role play as if they have diabetes. And they talk to the class about the life that they've had, how they discovered, what they go through, what kinds of medications they're on, and make it really a drama type process. And they have a great time with that. Incorporating as much humor as you possibly can in the classroom and outside the classroom really helps relieve those compassion fatigue moments. Modeling, participating, active listening and participation, I hear the voice of every single one of my students every single class period. There's not a silent time where they may say more one time and less another, but I hear their voice at least once during every class period. Mindfulness exercises. 
these are things that I typically ask students to do ahead of class time so we can we can move on from that, but they have to be taught how to do that. I also hold for the first year students a um, 30 minute to an hour wellness lecture before their very first class to teach them specific exercises in progressive relaxation, guided imagery, and I want them to each be able to lead it because they need to be leading the group to do the mind stretching before we get into the classroom. As well as service learning, we do daily check-ins, which that is part of the, the five minutes to say or ask anything. Redirection versus punishment. Even like, okay, okay, we're getting away from the topic here. Let's move on back. We can talk about your puppy in a minute, you know, and getting uh, kind of redirecting the curriculum back on course. Conflict, conflict resolution. Group goal setting. It is fantastic to see your students give each other high fives or air fives or fist bumps just when they complete a project or they accomplish something um, cooperatively. Relevance orientation and comprehension monitoring. It's easy to tell what's going on with your students if they're unable or unwilling to throw their ideas out. And if they don't come to class prepared, it, it very much stands out. And it doesn't mean every student is absolutely perfect every class period. Sometimes they'll have, there'll be a reason why they don't come prepared. And in that process, we make sure that it is a group goal and a group um, responsibility for everyone to be caught up. They help that student reorganize and re, um, recuperate information that they may not be totally up on. Mindfulness and meditation, two separate lists. So mindfulness activities improve the executive skill function and emotional intelligence in people, students, coworkers, everybody. They build the brain systems that regulate self-control, self-awareness, relationship skills, empathy, creativity, flexible thinking, and discipline, mindfulness. And I sometimes give a full workshop about ways to incorporate mindfulness, how you can do it, how to do mindfulness, how to lead mindfulness in a group, as well as how to do it individually. It would be another conference. <laughs> so meditation exercises often increase the self-regulation as well as mindfulness activities, increases attention, empathy, which also improves a student's ability to sustain focus and engage in flexible thinking. Coming up with alternative ways to treat patients, creativity is huge in the healthcare field. Being able to see your patient, seeing all the factors that go into treating that patient and be able to come with the best outcome guided by you, the healthcare professional. And doing and learning those things in the classroom is where they learn to do it. They're gonna take those skills and take them into the field. So I put this little time clock guy on the side to remind me to talk about the time. The things take, do take time to develop these skills. And that's why in their first year, I offer that um, lecture ahead of time just so they know how to do it themselves if they don't already, because we don't have time to do a full mindfulness or meditation exercise during every single class. However, sometimes if it's overwhelming and they're not going to learn that day, it may be to the advantage of the class to do a small shortened um, exercise to be able to bring them back into a learning place. Again, it's like stretching your mind before the big game. These are self-care strategies for the workplace to have on-site counseling, which I think most places do. 
education and training for self-care, which is part of what we're doing now, support groups for staff, and they don't have to be formal. I know many times there'll be a lunch bunch or uh, some everybody in your cluster or your particular nursing days. Um, however, the support groups may form uh, they usually form naturally, but there can also be some formal ones if they're if they're that's a stumbling block. Debriefing, talking about what is going on in your life, in your classrooms. And that doesn't mean gossip. It doesn't mean complain. It means debriefing what you experienced or what your successes might be in working in those situations. Massage sessions. I love that one. I wish that we could have that on every campus every day. <laughs> However, it may not be to the advantage. It is one that a lot of other countries have incorporated. Bereavement interventions, which again, we're already doing several of these things. Respecting spiritual needs. Integrating self-care plans into work evaluations. So this is something that is a little controversial. However, if a faculty member or an educator is not taking care of his self, himself or herself, their work is going to decline in um, length in quality and overall. Therefore, it is important to have a self-care plan worked into your uh, work evaluation because it, uh, it first makes you more aware where you are in the process of taking care of yourself and then that others are watching too and that doesn't mean it's a little it can be awkward like sharing with your boss for a work evaluation what you're doing to take care of yourself but that it's addressed somehow like I am meeting some of the things out of this and um, or to be able to refer it back to the group that you're working with like if the whole group has a exercise plan um, or everyone has a um, a new diet plan they're going to try, you know, no coffee or no sugar on the second floor. Those types of things are, are really good to work into, um, into the workplace. Okay, so if you take a few moments to answer these questions, and then I'll ask a few people if they would like to share some of their answers, and we'll talk about those. So the first is, it's important to express my feelings. Some of the ways I can do this include, and just um, answer in ways like if you're talking in your lunch bunch or if you're talking to your spouse or um, if you have your own personal therapist or any of the, the ways that you're able to express your feelings. To avoid overextending myself so I have energy to help others, I must set boundaries. I will plan to set limits by and answer how you plan to do that. Pleasure and happiness are needed to give my life balance. Identify at least two techniques that may help balance my life. As a professional, I need consultation with another professional to help me remain stable. I can get this consultation by I took it down. I can put it back up if anyone um, needs me to, um, to be able to answer these things. I may not be able to answer it in the first place. So if we could, I could have a volunteer. Okay, and Cliff Judy said he would be willing to um, read whatever happens in the chat too. I'll actually put up my share screen again so you can continue to see that. There we go. So you'll have those answers. 
So if I could have a volunteer to answer how they would address these things. I thought I was putting it into the chat for everyone, but then I just realized that I was only sending it out to hosts and panelists. So um, yes, please share if you feel comfortable. Um, I am monitoring whether anybody is raising their hands. You can also just post it right there into the chat. Um, really, really um, appreciate sharing because um, we want this to be a conversation. Um, the conference is always better when we have lots of participation and when we really and truly turn it into a conversation and not a presentation. Um, so we just had um, Kathy Pritchard, and I know that there are multiple Kathy Pritchards here because Kathy probably shared the link out. So um, Kathy or one of her invitees um, said that journaling really helps her um, express her feelings. Yes, absolutely. Journaling. It also, it not only gives you an outlet to be able to express yourself, it also allows you to look back. You have a record of where you were and where you've come and where you're going. You can work that into planning and uh, all the things that go with it. Journaling is fantastic. It doesn't even have to be formal journaling. I know even in my planner, like I'll put um, great day and maybe some reasons why, like it, not even in full sentences, something to be able to just um, put, put it down where the emotion can go. Great example. Anyone have any for um, how they might set boundaries? Um, I think Sarah or one of Sarah's um, invitees um, just said that exact question. She said for question two on setting boundaries, I need to understand that personal days are built in for a reason. There should not be any guilt or shame with understanding that I need a break too, which is probably a big deal, whether you're talking about personal days or just normal vacation days. Yes, absolutely. That's a perfect example setting the boundary in that um, not everybody even knows it has to be a personal day. It's a, I'm not available this day to work. And, um, you know, you don't have to explain yourself or excuse yourself. Perfect example. Okay. What about the consultation one? How are you gonna get consultation? So it's a hard thing. We have mentors um, many times in health science programs. Um, it may or may not be the person you want to go to. Sometimes it can be um, a supervisor. Sometimes it can be a colleague. Consultation does not have to be with someone outranking or with more experience. And Stephanie just mentioned um, it, it can be really hard to do this, but to set up our own counseling through the college or outside. Yes, yes, very much so. It's, it's become a little easier now that so many counselors are willing to do virtual um, because you don't always want to speak with counselor in your area. Sometimes you may have trained them all. <laughs> or you may just want somebody totally objective, doesn't know the situation, doesn't know the place. Uh, so so it, it has become a little bit more accessible, but it, it is hard to do. And it's something that you usually put on the back burner. You don't do it until there's a major need. So I would encourage you to do it, whether it's professional or casual or whatever kind of a way you can have that happen. Okay, move on a little bit. Um, Dr. Ferguson, we also just had Janine. And Janine, I'm going to um, allow you to talk here real quick. Uh, you're currently muted. So if you just wanted this to be in the chat, great. But if you want to share with us, I'm giving you the chance to right now. Just in case she didn't want to, she wanted to keep it just to the chat. I'll go ahead and read it. And Janine, if you want let to- me, Let me see if my microphone, is my microphone working now? All right. Yeah. Um, my, I've got a very anxious college student of my own uh, 
know, he graduated high school with COVID. So he's got a lot of the baggage our students have, you know, mm-hmm. that his senior year in high school wasn't what it was supposed to be. And so trying to find their balance. And um, we had a conversation because, you know, he's 20, so I can't make him go to the doctor uh, and take care of uh, advantage of student health. But we talked about the difference between a support system, which is calling a friend, let's go for coffee. You know, that could be us reaching out to a colleague saying, hey, you know, I'm having a rough day. Can we, you know, go out for a glass of wine after work versus a a resource, which is, you know, reaching out to a professional, um, a support group, uh, something like that, 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 you know, sometimes that you need one or the other, but, you know, because he kept saying, well, I don't need to go see somebody because I've got friends that I can call. And we talked about that difference between a support system and a resource. Great example. Yes. Thank you so much, Janine. Great example. Um, Having someone have professional knowledge about what's happening and what to do about it is also very important. Friends are fantastic. Um, Everybody needs them, whether you need um, professional consultation or otherwise. So the professional consultation is just an added advantage. It doesn't mean that there's something wrong. The stigma has lightened a lot over the years, but there still is a bit of stigma in that um, someone might need feel that they need to talk to someone when really every single person on this planet could benefit from having professional consultation. And then Sarah mentioned in the chat that there is a group that was created for her program with others in the same field at other colleges and other facilities, and they're meeting monthly to share current struggles and challenges, offering support and humor where we can. So that's not just somebody reaching out in a crisis situation. That's somebody who is actually scheduling regular opportunities for uh, everybody to share. That's fantastic. Wonderful. What a great example. So some of the challenges um, that we've talked about some of these things, the orientation to these things, what to expect, the buy-in from faculty and students, resource shortage, funding for training, having a data-driven practice, time and energy, of course, traumatized educators, and by that, also the word stressed or chronic stress and um, not having a strategy. Hopefully we can eliminate some of those things by giving you some strategy, but it takes time, programming, training, ongoing dialogue and courage to create the change. But to know that it is teamwork, we all are in this together and um, we can get to the best version of ourselves and our students if we do these things together and actually take some action to make some changes. It it doesn't change on its own. Um, Okay. So I'm moving into the introductory tips for self-care. And as we talk about these, take into consideration your own personal things that you do or that you want to do. And then we'll talk about how to establish what you're going to actually do for the future. So the very first thing is to inventory. First, take an inventory of your strengths and be honest, be honest with yourself, something you like to do and that you're good at doing. And this will be a personal list. Uh, We won't share these unless someone feels they'd like to, but, um, and you don't have to show these with any, to anyone to know your personal strengths. That way there, there's no embarrassment or modesty or anything like that. Risk factors. Last week, I showed you a list of risk factors and everyone had a few, at least a few that are on the list. And there's many lists out there for risk factors. They're all over the internet. Um, they'll, be, they'll be available in this particular um, educational presentation and coping skills. So it's the strengths, your personal strengths, what you came to the table with, the risk factors, what you're up against, and your coping skills. And this includes learned coping skills, not just the personal strengths that you have, but the things you've learned, things you know you can do, things that have worked things that work in particular populations. 
There's also a lot of tests out there, like there's the life stress self test, there's um, professional quality of life scale. There's a lot of things out there that uh, help identify some of the things for compassion fatigue. And I didn't center in on any particular one because there's not one over another that's really um, promoted within compassion fatigue. They all address pretty much the same symptoms. Second thing is to, from these lists, identify what elicits a strong personal reaction for you, including somatic signals and understanding your own tolerances. What days do you walk away with a headache or not feeling well or that your students do these things? The strong personal reaction, whether it is um, a disengaged student or a student who doesn't prepare or a coworker who's not addressing their compassion fatigue, whatever the case may be, what is it that elicits a strong personal reaction from you? And then recognizing compassion fatigue symptoms, which is what we talked about all last week, there's lists in every aspect of life. Recognize them in yourself as well as others. The next is to take time for personal recovery. And then I give a list of a few things that will help with that specifically that you can do yourself as well as you can work it into your classrooms. So in your personal recovery to uh, have creative outlets, uh, using resources, no matter what the recovery strategy you develop or you decide is going to work for you, it needs to happen every single day, Saturday, Sunday, every single day, there needs to be at least one thing that you do for recovery. It doesn't have to be the same thing that you do every single day, but it needs to be one thing that you do every single day. And then the fifth thing is to restore. And this is one to restore faith in something larger than yourself, whether that be God, whether that be healthcare, whether that be um, science, medicine, progress, growth, to restore faith and restore your mind, as well as the recovery process. Intervention. So this is very similar to the intervention I talked about with the classroom. And to evaluate. And it also goes along, of course, with the introductory tips, how to do these things, how to evaluate your current self-care functioning. If you're just terrible. <laughs> Use tools and peer feedback. To my students at the beginning of the semester, we all chose one thing that we were going to do that um, was contributed to our self-care and we wrote them on the board and they stay on the board and we'll do check-ins periodically, sometimes um, in that, that morning section. And an example of that is one student said that she was going to uh, put her phone down at eight o'clock every night eight o'clock on, there would be no electronics. It would be either reading, spending time with her family, playing with her dog, whatever the case may be, it would be no electronics. And it was on the board. And several of the students would text her at 8 p.m., like phones off, <laughs> you know, to be a check-in kind of situation. And she had um, decided that was one of the best classes in which she was succeeding. And she said, well, I'm going to apply that strategy. I don't know if it's going to work to the other ones, but she said, I do have a little more peace, um, you know, through the sleeping process and those types of things. So sometimes just one particular thing, because she wasn't doing anything before and she, or nothing that she could um, positively identify. And she said, just even having one thing that's on the board every day that she has to, to see was, was inspiration for her. And then select. We had another student who had chosen um, physical activity. She wanted to work out. 
and two or three weeks went in. She said, I'm going to need to change it. <laughs> I got to select, right? Um, I've got to select. I selected wrongly. I can't. It's not achievable. It's not reasonable. I don't have time for that. When the weather's bad, it's just not going to happen. And so when she chose a different way to um, participate in self-care, it was more effective. It, you know, she said, I feel guilty when I don't reach my goal and that's not working for me. And so to be able to reassess that and reassign was, was perfect for her. Writing the plan, and I'll give you a template of a way to make a contract to be able to sign your plan and a support person signing as a witness. Again, it can be colleagues, it can be students, it can be class members. We as a group in the classroom have become kind of each other's support person and we do check-ins to see how we're um, progressing. An activation, of course do it, and evaluate. Weekly, monthly, yearly, whatever it may be and to make note of the changes, how they might improve. Sometimes you add a second intervention or a third intervention, depending on how well you do and what your life demands or what you need at that time. And then adding. So self-care strategy suggestions. Enhance caring community. Um, communication styles. Last week, I had given an example about how when someone texts you and you just write back K instead of um, OK or instead of OK, thank you for talking with me, those types of things. So taking an extra moment to enhance a caring communication style and being more interactive maybe than you have been. It is very, very easy to come in after you've had a lot of incidents um, you know, your student, you've got another student in quarantine or someone's sick or you're sick where you walk into the classroom and you kind of want to cry, you kind of don't want to be there, those types of things, just to enhance that caring communication style. Um, thank you all for being here, for participating in, in everything that's happening, those types of things. Establishing boundaries. This is something that is difficult for healthcare providers to do. Sometimes this can mean life or death. And for us to say no or to set a boundary that harms another person is very, very difficult to do. However, long term, if we don't set boundaries and set boundaries early, don't wait until you're hurting or you can't take anymore or you can't answer another question. Set them early. Like I will answer questions from this time to this time. I will see patients from this time to this time and don't go outside of those boundaries. Sometimes the boundaries are specifically for yourself. Reframe difficult interactions. Even if it was a conflict that was totally unwarranted, what did you walk away from? I know I had a student um, who had, had spoken kind of harshly and she came to me the next day and she said, I'm very sorry, I was having a terrible day. She said, what do you think of me? And I said, well, I thought you were hurting. Like it, it wasn't about how she made me feel. It was that she was hurting and I could see that. It was to reframe the difficult interactions as to what is this person telling me about themselves beyond what their actual words are saying. And um, we also like, I'm so glad you're doing better today. How can I help you get into a better place? Resolve interpersonal problems. They don't go away. Tension doesn't lighten. It can lessen a little bit, but there's always that residual grit. And if you just address it and resolve it, it is much better to do. Articulate your experiences and feelings. And that doesn't mean every little thing. But, um, you know, we, we see that on Facebook sometimes. We don't need to know, you know, when, how you feels when raindrops are coming down. We don't need to know how it feels when your car is trying to tell you that you don't back up well. You know, those types of things. Um, articulate experiences and feelings that are relevant, that make a difference to you, and can help the situation. Using self-care strategies, of course. Striving for balance and using meditation and mindfulness and breathing just 
particular healthy breathing is very, very important. And to have a meaningful discussion at least one time a day, sometimes that can be your one self-care strategy is that one meaningful discussion. Sometimes people have this on like say um, carpooling, you know, the whole way home. It, you're able to vent or talk about things that, um, or even create ideas like, oh yeah, that I could learn from that talking with the other people one meaningful discussion. And sometimes it's things like the latest article you've read, have information sharing. It's like Dr. Dempsey shared with us earlier, the article that um, she had read that was really addressing um, what types of things that healthcare, the healthcare industry is facing. Self-care strategies. So these are some things to do and to not do. And it's continued. So spend some time alone, but avoid isolation. <laughs> um, balance is the overall theme to the whole self-care strategy section. So spending time alone, whether that be in a hot bath or um, in your bed reading, or if you have to get away from kids and animals, um, you can shut yourself in and um, spend that particular time alone. Again, driving, if you're not in a carpool situation, can be another great time to spend the time alone. Um, no radio, no nothing that is distracting, and unless the radio helps. Um, don't spend your time blaming others and complaining. It's not worth it. When you're frustrated, um, it's easier to go have a cry and look at what you can gain from it and maybe be able to troubleshoot or do problem resolution, but just flat out complaining or blaming others is pointless and it does not, it doesn't help any situation. Don't try to take shortcuts to recovery. It doesn't work, you have to do the work, have to do the work. And that doesn't mean to um, deny access to um, additional resources. One of my students, when we talked about this was like, try shortcuts. Does that mean like, if I'm um, anxious that I shouldn't take my meds? Like, no, that's not what that means. It's not a shortcut. Take all of the things that you need to, that go into your life to contribute to your recovery. Shortcuts are things like um, drug and alcohol abuse, short escapes, impulsive type behaviors that may create a short-term relief but long-term is not going to be effective. Meet your physical needs, sleep enough, eat enough, move enough, um, interact enough, all the physical things that you need. And do allow support from others. It's easier said than done because we're the ones that provide the support. We're the ones that are the healers. And so allowing others to heal us, even if it's for a psychological or emotional situation can be very, very difficult. So establishing goals, again, just like we talk about with our students in treatment planning, they need to be reasonable and maintainable. It's also better if they can be measurable. You either do it or you don't. There's an outcome or there's not. But reasonable and maintainable. And if you set a goal and you think that you've got a reasonable and maintainable goal and it's not working for you, change it. You have to do something to take care of yourself and find something that's something, whatever it is. And schedule an event, an event that to look forward to at least once a week. I know um, as far as uh, with students, we look forward to Friday roundup. Everybody's laughing and um, reflecting on the week and talking about what they're gonna do that weekend. It's really, even though it is a roundup and it is educational and informative and a lot of information processing, happen, information processing happens there, it's very, very similar to a group therapy session and it has the same effects, something you look forward to. As well as the, some things that you may look forward to once a week, it may be being off work, you know, doing something on the weekend.
So these are the big ones. These are the ones everybody um, usually thinks of when they think of self-care. So physical exercise. It doesn't mean you have to be a tri triathlon athlete. It doesn't mean that you need to start joining 5Ks or any of that kind of thing. It can mean something as simple as going on a walk at lunch. About 30 minutes, three times a week is good for mental health. It's good at stress reduction. We have to work those stress chemicals through our body. And the more we move, the better it will be. Nutrition, of course, a balanced diet and monitoring the intake of caffeine and sugar. Easier said than done, I realize. And sometimes it's either caffeine or sugar. Better to be both. And then also limit or eliminate alcohol use. Even in downtime, um, what you're doing in time that you're not at work or not teaching or not a student um, matters. It's going into your body. It's going to affect the days that you are engaged and you are on the clock, so to speak. Sleeping regularly, don't oversleep, don't undersleep, have sleep regulation. And if you have difficulty with this, you can also see a physician. It does not mean that um, there isn't maybe a sleep problem. Hygiene. A lot of people leave this one out and it is very, very important because it is part of the um, maintaining the body and the mind. Having your nails done, having your hair cut, skin treatments, having your teeth cleaned, making sure that you're brushing and flossing every single day. The amount of microbes that actually enter your body through your mouth, gum tissue. And if you have inflamed um, oral tissues, that just goes right into your bloodstream and affects your heart, your brain, digestive system, everything. Hygiene is extremely important for overall healthy body care. Hobbies. Find something that is satisfying to you, whether it's journaling. Um, so many people that I know nowadays are doing the adult coloring books that it's really a peaceful process for them. Writing, music, games, art, storytelling, and some of those things are incorporated into family life. And sometimes you may be doing it by yourself. Sometimes um, you may have dance night at at, at home and it doesn't even have to last very long just if there's a little bit of something. I would recommend avoiding entertainment that is anxiety or depression provoking. I talked about this with students and um, they said that they, they would even do tests to see, like watch a scary movie and see how they perform. They were much more likely to cry a day after they'd experienced something that was anxiety or depressive um, that they'd watched recently than they were if they weren't um, to be able to, to maintain your emotions because it is stimuli. You control the stimuli that comes into your, your mind. We're getting enough in the world right now. Now, Halloween's coming, so it's a little bit different with the, the scary stuff and costumes and things like that that may be anxiety provoking. But keep in mind, like specific purposeful stimuli it can be damaging and contribute to compassion fatigue. Like I said, life is scary enough right now. Um, the things we see in the um, professional life and classroom and the news. So having a support system, a network of reliable as well as trustworthy people who accept you as a person and promote personal wellness aren't going to nag you. They're not going to shame you. They're not going to, unless that's something that your particular group is into, um, being able to promote your personal wellness overall, mind, body, everything that goes into it. 
The next is an example of a self-care plan. And like I said, um, I, I've done this type of work in all different places. And typically I usually have um, all the participants print this and um, complete it, write it right then, and then have a witness signature right there in um, the, the presentation, be able to witness that this person is going to abide by these things. Um, we can't really do that over virtual, but I would encourage you take it, take it into your lives, take it into your workplaces and make contracts, make um, self-care plans and contracts with your coworkers and with students. I do midterm reviews with all of my students, and this is one of the things um, that we do. Sometimes it's formal, sometimes it's informal. And what are they doing to take care of themselves? The same that we do or that I do with the uh, work evaluations. What's in the way of you taking care of yourself? What can you do about that? The outcomes. The outcomes of self-care, personal wellness, continuing quality service for others. If you remember, this is one of the effects of compassion fatigue is we're losing quality service. The standards of healthcare decline. And if we do address these things in self-care as well as um, incorporating it into our curriculum early on, the continuing quality service for others can happen. Allowing healing and wellness to be promoted through example and education. I guarantee that when you teach these things to students, especially beginning students, that at some point in their career and maybe more often than others, they will repeat it to another person, whether it is to a patient, to a coworker, whatever the case may be. They will repeat how to take care of themselves, what to do and symptoms that they're seeing. We reduce compassion fatigue and build resilience just having our satisfaction back, you know, loving our work, loving life, love to do what we do, having a sense of achievement and staying with it, taking that 18% way on down. As well as not getting sick. Uh, we talked about mental illness as well as physical illness being symptoms of compassion fatigue and uh, taking symptoms of everything, being able to take some action against it. I took this picture the other day um, on my way home and it just made me happy. Um, the different colors, the things that went into it, it was just this last week. So, um, in a study um, by Leodoro, he found that job satisfaction ratings are proportionate to the number of resiliency factors, which um, we kind of talked about before, having resiliency or not having resiliency doesn't dictate compassion fatigue. It is that the more you're doing to take care of yourself, the more satisfaction you're going to have in life, in your profession, in general. So why do we do this? The self-care continued. Remember why you chose to do this kind of work and appreciate the inherent rewards it offers. Why did I do this? Why do I choose to put myself in, in harm's way or to put myself in a position to experience compassion fatigue? We do this to participate, to be part of healing and growing for humanity, for individuals, for communities. Have discovery of new skills and deeper humanity. So much we discover about ourselves and other people in the work that we do. Finding inspiration 
through individual courage and determination. Some of the patients and students that I have met over the years have been the most inspiring individuals to me. And um, I wouldn't have that if it weren't for the kind of work that I do and how inspiring I try and share their stories as often as I can because of how much they've in fact impacted me and hopefully impacting the world around them. Finding meaning, greater social, spiritual, political meaning, whatever kind of meaning you're looking. Have an appreciation for life and beauty, nature, love, happiness in general, truly appreciating happiness. When you see a patient or a student walk away satisfied and educated and uh, enhanced, it's beautiful. And the renewal and growth from your experiences in every single way. Those things can be uh, the most uh, impactful. It's hard to describe the things that you, you come across in a, a career of these things. I'll give you one example on about an inspiring individual. I had been working with um, some folks in Pakistan. There had been an earthquake in that region and many of the buildings had fallen one of which was a school. And many of the children were killed. Other members were maimed. They lost um, arms or legs or, you know, various things, head injuries and that type of thing. And in dealing with them, they were all around middle school age. And they, and a lot of them, their parents had perished in the same earthquake. It was a pretty major um, thing. You may have remembered in that region a few years ago. So I was talking with this young boy and he was probably 10 or 11 and um, he had lost an arm and he was talking about, you know, how he'd been doing in school and his friends and he'd lost some of his friends had died in the same, same accident. And um, in that particular culture, they marry very young. And he was talking about how he was coming to the age where he needed to start thinking about a wife. And again, he was very young. And I said, well, uh, what are your thoughts about that? And he said, he got so tickled with himself. And he said, I'm going to have to find a wife that's got the other arm. <laughs> that's just how it's going to work. And I said, I think that's a great idea. And he was so resilient, had such positive thoughts about the situation. And he meant it. He was going to look for a wife that had the other arm. If she was missing an arm, that's fine. Um, they'd all been through this together and they were all willing to heal and move on together. And it was extremely inspiring. So I tell that story pretty often. That's one of hundreds that, you know, I've experienced over the years, but, um, you know, just one example of what we learn from our patients and what we learn from our students and the folks that um, we've encountered throughout our journey in healthcare. So, uh, I will move on to questions and answers. And with the questions and questions and comments, I also like if there's anything about the particular care plan or any of those types of things that you have questions about, feel free to ask those. And you can ask them in the comment section or in the, um, you can do it by voice too. All right, Cliff, Judy, you're back in charge. All right, let me adjust everybody's view so you can actually see me. Yes, so please, please do raise your hands. We're looking for participation. Throw them into the chat like you were earlier. We appreciate it. Um, I, uh, while we're waiting to see a hand raised or waiting for somebody to throw something into the chat, um, do you mind going back over um, substance abuse? I feel like I have heard a ton of numbers since the pandemic started about alcohol abuse and other and other things where people are turning to that temporary um, that temporary relief, if you want to call it that. I don't know. 
Yes, outlet, that's how I refer to them. Okay. Uh, yeah, so I will talk about that. Um, many times, especially um, legal drugs or prescription drugs or alcohol, it's easy to use those things for an outlet because they do um, give some temporary relief and sometimes are prescribed by our physicians, right? So when you think about that, it may um, begin as something that is um, appropriate and helpful in circumstances of chronic stress, it is very, very easy for that line to be crossed into ineffective coping with the, in the same mechanisms. And, you know, where does that line change? The line changes when it affects the work that you're trying to do. If you're hungover at work, if you're ineffective, if you have to call in, if um, it makes you unhappy to be sober or makes you unhappy to be um, doing what you're doing and you want to be in that dazed fog or affected in some way, um, those things are when it crosses the line. It's when it's, it's no longer um, recreational and no longer medical, it becomes um, a problem. Uh, similar things are happening with eating and um, other impulsive type behaviors. So be very, very careful of those things. It's another reason why a group as well as um, social interactions are very, very important. So if someone sees you or you see someone crossing those lines, just say, hey, you know, watch out. This is something that can happen really easily. It doesn't mean you have to ask them if that's what's happening or um, just making sure that they know that the support is actually there and they can do something about it other than um, whatever it is damaging they might be doing. Like I said, overeating, drug alcohol, whether it's prescription, um, those types of things, all of those things are increasing with compassion fatigue and the chronic stress that we're all experiencing. Thank you very much. Anybody else? I'm watching for hands raised, throw stuff into the chat, any Q&A that we can do here and turn this into a further conversation. So I think part of this one that just got thrown in was a question for me. How will we be able to get the recordings from both this session as well as the last? Um, so I am pretty much everybody here, most of the people here were um, registered. Um, for the Zoom event. And so we've got your emails in our system. Um, or if you are invited, I know that we've got multiple people here who are listed as Kathy or who are listed as Sarah and so on and so forth. So I am going to be sending out both the PowerPoint slides and the videos of last Friday's presentation and today's presentation. So we're going to be emailing that out, uh, probably some YouTube links. So we've got to get the video together edit it down so we don't have, you know, 10 minutes of uh, non-presentation off of the start. So give us a couple of days. We're going to be uploading them and we will email it out. So if you got a an invitation from Kathy or from Sarah and you're not actually that person, don't worry, I'm going to be sending it to them and then they can send it along to you. Um, let's see here. So has medical marijuana made compassion fatigue worse? And are there any studies supporting uh, findings or, or at least anecdotal observations? I don't know about any current studies. I'm not an expert in substance abuse necessarily. I do know that across the board, all damaging things that people turn to have been reported. They're on the scale of again, impulsive behaviors or, or counterproductive behaviors. Um, marijuana, making it legal makes it easier to get. Um, but as far as the abuse, um, I haven't seen actual numbers as to what's happening with that. But across the board, lots of people, it is going up. The numbers are going up as far as um, counterproductive coping skills. I don't know, I'd be interested to hear that if you do have more information. Getting some more, uh, getting some more feedback about how helpful this was. So again, Dr. Ferguson, thank you. Um, 
so much. Uh, and and we're, we're hearing some of the similar things that we heard last Friday is that this should be shared far and wide and not just with um, uh, health sciences instructors. We've got people talking about uh, behavioral health programs. Um, last week, we had somebody who just basically said anybody right now in education should be hearing yes. this because of how much we can, uh, how much we can do to benefit our students. Um, yes. Anybody else with, uh, raise your hands. Anybody else want to um, share anything else? Any further questions? I do want to say as far as the um, compassion fatigue and recognizing symptoms and what to do about them, putting that into your curriculum is going to take it miles. Um, being able to help people in the profession is fantastic, but that educational piece, incorporating it into the education is going to go the length of their career and the length of their life. Like I said, I guarantee they will repeat that knowledge at some point in their career or maybe constantly in their career. So while I give those as suggestions, the things how to do it and um, how to create the therapeutic classroom, it's really important to do that, not just for um, those particular students or the people right in front of you, but for our future, um, they're going to be taking care of us. They need to know how to take care of themselves and how to do it well. I want a happy, healthy nurse to take care of me someday if I need it. And a um, happy, healthy, every kind of um, healthcare provider out there. They've got to have the resources early to be able to survive as a student, as a healthcare professional, a healthcare educator, all of those things. And we've got to model it, folks. We've got to do it ourselves. We've got to give this to our students. Uh, because it's gonna it's gonna hurt us and it already is so let's com combat it together what an incredible opportunity to set us up on a really foundational level um well i haven't seen anybody um share this out as far as uh share something in the chat or raise their hands among the attendees so um if you do have a question if you do have a contribution or anything like that throw it out there, but I am going to say a huge thank you to everybody who attended, um, everybody who showed an interest, especially so, some of our folks who are sharing the link out, like I said, with uh, Kathy and Sarah, we had a lot of people come here, it looks like based on recommendations from people who were here on Friday, so thank you very much for sharing that out. Um, thank you to Dr. Ferguson. Tremendous presentation. Um, this is exactly what I think we were looking for and exactly what Dr. Hutton Gann, our organizer, was looking for when she came up with the idea a couple of months ago. Um, Dr. Dempsey had to hop off because she's a very busy person, but I want to thank Dr. Christy Dempsey from Press Ganey. I also want to thank our friends over at Central Methodist University for sponsoring us. Um, I am Cliff Judy with Missouri Community College Association. Um, I threw my um, email up higher in the chat, but in case anybody needs it, feel free to reach out to me at any time. I'm our membership development person. I'm our professional development person. So I am here for a lot of different roles. If you have any feedback or anything like that, we've also got our convention coming up in a month. Um, so yeah, hit me up anytime. I know I'm wearing my state fair gear in honor of Dr. Ferguson and Dr. Hutton Gann, uh, but, uh, but uh, lots, lots of opportunity for some more engagement and uh, letting us know how we can continue doing events like this that will benefit you all and provide some value for you in your professional lives. Um, I have had some ask about using this material in a professional development format. Okay, um, I'm not sure. It, so Sarah, one of the Sarahs said, I've had some, some people ask about using this material in a professional development format. And I know that Dr. Ferguson had talked about all of the slides that you're going to be seeing are either things that she herself um, either made or they're open source, meaning that they are usable, they are shareable. Um, Dr. Ferguson, any concerns there at all? No, I give my full permission to use any materials that I've presented to you today, as well as any stories, any examples, any of those things. And if you um, need or want questions for me later as well, um, Cliff Judy will have my contact information that he can provide. Um, share it and share it wide. 
All right. Thanks so much. And with that, um, not seeing any further questions or comments or anybody else raising their hands, I think we can get a, give everybody uh, 24 minutes of their time back. Thanks again to everybody for joining. Thank you again, Dr. Ferguson. This was tremendous and uh, hopefully a jumping off point for some really excellent foundational um, protection of our students and our future nurses and our future health sciences folks. Have a great day, everybody.